Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever in the world you are. We are glad that you are with us. We wish to welcome you to the daily Bible study for the Sea Lion Church of Christ. If you have been to our building, you know where we are. If, on the other hand, if you are joining us from someplace else in the world or someplace else in the Philippines, we are located in Bayan, or city proper, of Silang Cavite, Philippines, which is approximately 30 miles, or 50 kilometers, south of downtown Manila. We hope that our study of God's Word is of benefit to you today. As always, we'll start with our prayer, and Raymond, would you lead the prayer, please? Okay, join me with prayer, please. Mm, Lord, thank you for the blessings that you give to us. Also, uh, Sister Rochelle, still praying for her sister, safety in Kuwait, enlightenment for her, son. her sister, son. good enlightenment for her son, good health for her entire family, and good health for all of us. Thank you. And uh, for Sister Furley, thanksgiving for all the blessings, guidance, and protection. <laughs> Good health for all of us. Continue healing for her mother. Wisdom and knowledge. Uh, for Sister Marcel, thanksgiving for all blessings. Praying for good health, guidance, and protection, and wisdom for all of us. For Sister Christy, giving for her protection with her entire family and praying for her condition regarding her health and also pray for the Philippines between Taiwan and China, issue of West Philippine Sea and also Israel. Sister Senesa um, is thanksgiving for her blessings that she gave to us as this evening to me, asking for uh, more wisdom and knowledge and peace for her mind and her friend of Janet. Um, is there uh, also include for Mom Cora uh, uh, praying for uh, wisdom, uh, praying for healing, healing prayers for Claudio, Rosella, Mr. Kelly, Jim Willis, Danny, Odi, and wisdom for Mary Joy. And also for my prayer request, uh, thanksgiving for the blessings that you give to us. My prayer request is guidance, protection, strength, wisdom, and knowledge to my family. To my sister, guide her for her interview. Also to myself, forgive me for my sins. And praying for uh, uh, Alan's mother, also his new journey, the new career path. Uh, Sister, Maricel, Sister Maribel um, continues praying for her enlightenment, knowledge, and wisdom, thanksgiving for all blessings and guidance and protection. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Um, as we continue our study of uh, the Trinity, uh, we've moved into, we've well established that the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit are unique and distinct individuals. However, today we're going to shift our focus a little bit, and we're going to deal with the deity of Jesus Christ. We're going to deal with the fact that Jesus is deity. And uh, a place to start here is John chapter 1, verse 1. John chapter 1, verse 1. Miss Rochelle? Unmute, please. John chapter 1, verse 1. Yes, please. Okay. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Okay. Now, there's a couple of different things that we want to take a look at in John chapter 1 and verse 1. Uh, because while every major translation references this as... God, the word logos was God, 
what that actually actually sounds like in Greek if we read it is logos the word I I mean meaning um, to exist without contingency or to be in place of and then of course theos that is in some translations I'm going to say intentionally mistranslated um, as you guys have heard me say before text without context is a pretext for a proof text so we want to use the context so that we come to an understanding in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God now we're going to see in John chapter 1 starting in verse 14 that the word referred to Jesus the Christ give us verse 14 please Sanessa and the word became flesh and dwelt among us and we have seen his glory glory as the only son from the father full of grace and truth okay and then we're also uh, read verse 15 please miss christy john john 1 15 said john bore witness about him and cried out this was he of whom I said, he who comes after me ranks before me because he was before me. Okay. So, by the way, what is the relationship between the physical relationship between God, uh, Jesus, and John the Baptist, John the Immerser? Does anybody know? Hello. Say it again, please. What is the physical relationship between John the Immerser and Jesus the Christ? Cousins. Very good. Thank you much, sweetheart. They first, were cousins. first cousins. Actually, I think they were second cousins. Because in order to have been in order to have been first cousins, Mary and Elizabeth would have had to have been sisters. So second cousin. All right. Verse 16, please, Miss Furley. Verse 16 says, For whom his fullness we have all received, grace upon grace. Okay. And verse 17, please, uh, Raymond. It says, for the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. So we see that grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ. You see, the only begotten Son of the Father became flesh and dwelt among us. We saw that in verse 14. And this really testifies to the fact that Jesus was a separate individual from the, from the Father. He was with the Father. And yet he himself possessed deity or the form of God. And we saw that in John 1.1. 1, 1. Uh, the context affirms that both Jesus is deity and Jesus is human. God became flesh and dwelt among us. We see that the case. Uh, there are those who, like I said, intentionally in my thought, misinterpret the Greek here. Um, and they make the statement that there's no definitive article before the word God. Therefore, a definitive article is with God. Hence, it is claimed that Jesus was a lower G or different form of God, different from the Father. And this you see primarily see in the New World Translation, uh, where it says the word dwelt, the word was a little g god however all major translations the word was god none says was a god uh, so what we see is a major contradiction between the purpose written new world translation and the king james american standard new american standard revised standard esv niv it, go down the list okay 
Um, if Jesus was, as the Jehovah's Witnesses and the INC people claim, a God in a lesser sense than the Father, then we would have two different gods, or polytheism, if you will. Clearly, Jesus was not a false god. Therefore, he was true God. But if he was a lower G God in a different sense than the Father, that violates the passages that say there is only one true God. Many scriptures use the word God, theos, without an article to refer to the true God. So let's take a look at some of those passages where we see no definitive predecessor in article. Matthew 5, 9 would be a place to go. Matthew chapter 5, verse 9. Maricel? Good morning, Fred. Good morning. Matthew uh, chapter 5, verse 9. Blessed, blessed are the peacemakers, for, for they shall be called sons of God. They shall be called sons of God, not sons of a God. Matthew chapter 6, verse 24. Matthew chapter 6, verse 24. Please, Maribel. Matthew chapter 6, verse 24 says, No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other. Or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. You cannot serve God, Theos. And there is no definitive article ahead of time. Uh, Luke chapter 1, verse 35. Luke chapter 1, verse 35. Miss Wilma? Matthew chapter 5, verse 25. Print up. 35. Luke chapter 1, verse 35. Yes, please. Okay. And the angel answered her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be called Holy, the Son of God. Son of God. Once again, no definitive in the Greek. And Romans chapter 17, verse 17. Romans 17, 17. Please, we are... Which verse did you say? No, 17. 16, 17? Yes, please. Okay, 16, 17. And it says, I urge you, brothers and sisters, to watch out for those who cause division and put obstacles in your way that are contrary to the teachings you have learned. Keep away from them. So do not argue with people who have misunderstanding. Now understand, we can also look at John chapter 1, verse 6, John chapter 1, verse 12, John chapter 1, verse 13, John chapter 1, verse 18, and many other places. Now, it is true that many scriptures use the word theos or God, mm -hmm. both with and without an article within the same context. Yet both of these contexts clearly refer to the same true God. Uh, Matthew chapter 4, Matthew chapter 4. Give us verses 3 and 4, please, Vanessa. Matthew chapter 3, no, verse chapter four. Uh, Matthew chapter 4, verse 3 and 4 says, And the tempter came and said to him, If you are the Son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. For, but he, answer, but he answered, It is written, Man shall not live by bread only. Man. I alone. Man bread alone. Live. Very good. Man does but, not live by bread alone. Mm -hmm, but by every word, that comes from the mouth of God. 
Okay. So within that same context, Matthew chapter four, verses three and four, it is used in the first time with a definitive and the second time it is not, does not have a definitive. We can see this also in Luke chapter 20, Luke chapter 20, verses 37 and 38. 16, Red, please. 17. Luke 20, verse 38. 37 and 38. 37 and 38 reads, But in the account of the burning bush, even Moses showed that the dead rise, for he calls the Lord the God of Abraham and the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob. He is not the God of the dead, but of the living, for he himself all are alive. So what we see is the word theos or God is used both with a definitive and without a definitive. So the entire argument that the New World Translation has in relation to their translation or intentional mistranslation, if you will, of John chapter 1 and verse 1 shows that their premise within Greek is not good. Uh, we can look at the context going back to John chapter 1, verse 1. You've heard me say this a bunch of times, and sometimes it comes up again. Text without context? It's a pretext. Uh, for our proof text. For? It's a pretext for? A proof text. A proof text. Proof text. Okay. Uh, Miss Rochelle, give us John chapter 1, verses 1 to 3, please. Hey. John chapter 1, verse, verse 1. 1, 2, and 3. 1, 2, and 3. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He, verse 2, He was in the beginning with God. And verse 3, All things were, were made through Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. So, Jesus is the Creator. We established that. And to call Him God in such a context, capital G, God, must surely mean that He is God in the same sense as the Father is God. We're also going to see that Jesus is referred to as the word theos, or God, using a definitive article. If the translation, New World Translation, is a valid translation, then these passages must prove conclusively that Jesus is God in the same sense as the Father. We saw in John chapter 1, verse 1, that both Jesus and the Father are referred to as God in the context that researches the eternal existence of Jesus and that he is the creator of all things, which we just read. This would be blasphemy if he does not possess the same deity as the Father. Now, the translators Marshall and Bine and Vincent and Lenski and Robertson and other translators, Greek scholars, if you will, contend that the article is absent from the was God in John chapter 1, verse 1, not to imply that Jesus was a lesser God. Rather, it was simply to identify God as the predicate nominative, despite the fact that it precedes the verb for emphasis. And we see this in a Greek textbook called Caldwell's Rule. If it had been a definitive article, there would imply that the word and the father are the same person. In any case, the scriptures listed above that we've looked at, that they lack the article that does not prove that Jesus is some kind of a lesser God. Now let's move our text from John chapter 1 to Colossians chapter 2. Colossians chapter 2 and verse 9, Miss Vanessa. Uh, 
Colossians 2, verse 2. 9. 9. For in him the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily. Deity. Of deity dwells bodily. Okay, so what we see is the fullness of the deity, Godhead, Theos, is in Jesus the Christ. It dwells in him in a bodily form. Fullness. Uh, the Greek word here means that it's brought to completion or fullness, the sum total, even maybe even a superabundance. It is the full measure of deity. Question. Goes there. In your verse, in your Bible verse, does deity starts with a capital D? Read. Not. It's not. It is not. Mine does. You got have an NIV? Uh huh. Okay. For for in Christ all the fullness of the deity lives in the bodily form. Okay, give me a second. But I have a um, I have my notes says uh, it means God. It does. Well, that's what deity means. And by the way. The Greek word here, since I'm using my Greek lexicon in the background, uh, it does say theotos, which is theos. According to the theolo theological dictionary of the New Testament, it is a divine being. And by the way, the Strong's number, if anybody's inter is interested, is 2320, which is the deity of God in its entirety, dwelt in the body of Jesus Christ. This is really a full measure of being God. There are some people out there who are misinformed, and they will claim that Jesus possesses only the characteristics of God, but not his essence or his substance. And this tends to confuse or twist the Greek language because the Greek word here is theotos, meaning the essence or state of being God. This is a different word from the word that is used for divinity or the characteristics of God. However, how could Jesus possess the full, the complete measure of the characteristics of God in a bodily form, if he was not God. Even if the mistaken definitions were accurate, the passage would still prove that Jesus is God. Hebrews chapter 1 and verse 3. Hebrews chapter 1 and verse 3. Miss Christie? Hebrew 1 3 says, um, verse 1 3. Uh, he is the regions of the glory of God and the, and the exact imprint of his nature. And he upholds the universe by the word of his power. After making purification for sin, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. So what we see here is that Jesus the Christ is the express image of his, the Father's image. We see that in King James and the New King James, or the very image of his substance, American Standard, the exact representation of his nature, New American Standard, the exact representation of his being, NIV. See, all of this context describes Jesus as the creator far above the angels so that he deserves to be worshipped. And we're going to look at that a little bit more. The express image means the exact 
expression of any person or thing, a marked likeness, precise reproduction in every detail. So says Grim Wilkie and Thayer. Uh, a person means substance, quality, nature of any person or thing. Once again, Grim Wilkie and Thayer. Substantially more in the absence of actually being an exact representation of his real being. We see that in Bauer, Arnett, and Gingrich. However, Jesus is the precise reproduction in every respect of the essence of the actual being of reality God. And how would it be possible for Jesus to be an expression of the real being of Father? without himself being truly deity. Now, as we know, and we will study later on, God possesses certain characteristics that are so unique that no one but God could possess them. For example, give me some of the omnis. Does anybody know the omnis of God? Give me one, Fred. Will you say the what of God? Omnis. I'm not familiar with that term. Okay. All powerful is omnipotent. Omniscient. Um, omnipotent. Omnipotent. Okay. okay. All knowing. Mm -hmm. uh, omniscient, right? Sure. Omniscient. What is the uh, what is the <laughs> one that says God the Father is in heaven, but he's he can see? Uh, everywhere. All knowing. That's the, all that, knowing. By the way, that's the model of prayer you're, you're supporting for us. We are. Okay. So what that's about all? Would... What about all existing? Eternal. Eternal. Uh, I... Omni. <laughs> <laughs> you see, when you say omni, what it means is all. Okay. That Jesus possesses these characteristics makes it a necessity that he be deity. Um, Philippians chapter 2, Philippians chapter 2. Start us in verse 6, please, Farley. Philippians chapter 2, verse 6, please, Hurley. After Philippians chapter 2, verse 6. Who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped. Seven, please, Mary so. Verse seven, but, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. Verse eight, please, Maribel. Verse eight six, says, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient of the point of death, even death on a cross. Now I want you to think about this for just a moment, because what Philippians chapter 2, verses 6 through 8 tells us is that Christ existed in the form of God. But he didn't seek self-aggrandizement or self-promotion. Uh, the American standard says a thing to be grasped, to be equal with God. Instead of seeking his position equal with God, he made himself of no reputation, uh, emptied himself in the ASV. He took the form of a servant, and he came in the likeness of a man. He was found to, in appearance to be as a man, and he humbled himself. Humbled himself to what? To even a death on a cross. 
And this teaches that before coming to earth, Jesus ex existed in the form of God. We saw that in verse 6. Um, King James, New King James, American Standard all say, being in the very nature of God, form. This is a special characteristic, a feature, a person, or a thing, so says Vine's commentary. This really means that Jesus the Christ truly possessed deity before he came to earth. And what we see in verse 7 is he used the same words to say the form of a servant. So was Jesus the Christ really a servant on earth? Of course he was. We see this in Matthew chapter 20. Matthew chapter 20 and verse 28. Miss Wilma? Matthew chapter 20 verse 28 says, even as the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. So he came to do what? To serve. To serve. Not to be a servant, not to have servants, but to be one. You see, before he came to earth, he really had the exact nature of God. And one of the things we've already studied is that God cannot lose the characteristics of God. If Jesus the Christ ever possessed these characters, then he always possessed them, including during the time while he was on earth. He could never exist without posing or possessing these qualities, and nothing in Scripture says anything different. What we saw in verse 6 is he did not consider it robbery to be equal to God. He did not count on being is uh, equality with God something to be grasped. We see that American Standard, New American Standard, and NIV. Some claim that these later translations mean that he was not equal with God and he did not exalt himself to try to become equal with God. And this view, to my thinking, counterindicates or contradicts the context of the other passages that we're going to study. You see, it's already shown in verse 6 and other passages that Jesus really existed in the form of God before coming to earth. And Paul had already said that Jesus was equal with God. Verse 7 tells us that Jesus made himself of no reputation or he emptied himself by becoming a man and the context is not discussing whether or not jesus wanted to exalt himself he did not want to be greater than he already was you see he's showing us that within this context here in philippians that he already had an exalted position it's not something he needed it's not something he was seeking because he already had it but what we see here is that he's willing to humble himself and take a lower status and take a lower reputation than what he had what we see in philippians verse 6 is that jesus already possessed the deity but was also willing to accept a lower position that of being a human this is not discussing whether he wanted to achieve some higher position. By the way, as we all have jobs, we always know there's one guy in the group that's always trying to get the next promotion. What we see here in Philippians is that Jesus was equal to God. But it did not consider it something that he had to grasp or to jealousy hold on to or to retain a thing. It's not like he was a robber taking something that did not belong to him and then holding on to it with all of his determination. He did not look upon equality with God above all things to be clung on to. He was by right 
equal with God from the beginning of time, then willingly he submitted himself to the position of a servant. He made himself of no reputation or he emptied himself, depending on the translation. Uh, we saw that in Philippians chapter 2, verse 7. So in this sense, Jesus did not try to hold on to something. In what sense did Jesus make himself empty? Some say he gave up. He lost. Maybe he no longer possessed some characteristics of deity. However, that's impossible. As we already discussed, God cannot lose the qualities of being God. Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 8. Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 8. We are. Hebrews 13, uh, chapter 13, verse 6, and it says, verse eight, please. Uh, verse 8, and it says, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. Okay, so where in Hebrews chapter 13, eight, verse 8, does it say he emptied himself of the characteristic of God? Neither the passage we looked at in Hebrews 13 nor any other passage says this. The, go ahead and give me verse 9 to go with that. Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 9. And 9 says, Do not be carried away by all kinds of strange teachings. It is good for our hearts to be strengthened by grace, not by eating ceremonial foods, which is no benefit to those who do so. Okay. So what we see is that Christ humbled himself. And he did not hold on to a position as if it were his, he stole it. Christ humbled himself and he sacrificed was his reputation. What he sacrificed was his privilege of being God. What he sacrificed was the glory of being God. What he sacrificed was the honor of being God. What he sacrificed was status in the eyes of men. He did not appear on earth before men with the same glory that he had in heaven. However, he appeared as a man, as a servant. In this way, what we see in Philippians is that he, he emptied himself of his privileges. He put those aside. He made himself of no reputation. It was his reputation and his glory he lost, not his divine power and characteristic. How am I doing on time? I'm over time. We will pick this up tomorrow because this is we're just getting into the meat of the topic. Let me stop the broadcast.